Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 22nd, 2016, and my guest is author and writer Tim Harford of The Financial Times. He was a guest on Econ Talk in May of 2011 to discuss his book, Adapt. And he's here today to discuss his latest book, Messy, The Power of Disorder to Transform Our Lives. Tim, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks very much, Russ. Now, I'm a little disappointed when I read the book that only a small portion of it is about the virtues of a messy desk, you know, as a particular example, which is a lifelong habit of mine. But it turns out you're interested in messy writ very large. So let's start by talking about what you mean by messy. So, I mean, I do partly mean literal mess, the, the, the mess of a, of a cluttered inbox or a cluttered office or, or, a, or a, an untidy desk, all of that. But yes, I, I also mean a more metaphorical mess. So um, the, the sense of annoyance when you get interrupted, or when you have to work uh, in a complex team with, with people who you don't really agree with, who, who come from a different background, um, or the, the mess of ambiguity versus a very tidy system of targets and quantification, um, or the mess of improvising uh, a response, whether you're on a sales desk or whether you're uh, running to be president, versus the, the tidiness of, of prescripting everything. So it's, it's really an argument that um, we instinctively like to keep things tidy. We like things to be systematic. We, we feel bad if we don't keep things tidy. We like to quantify things. Uh, we like targets. We like preparation. We like script. We we all of these things make us feel better. But actually, the things that we really value, for example, responsiveness, um, creativity, speed, uh, resilience, they often have big elements of mess inextricably bound up with them. So the book explores lots and lots of different examples of that and and how we can learn to suppress our own tidy minded tendencies. Uh, one thing you didn't talk much about, or maybe I missed it, was why we have this desire for order. And it's certainly true that I think people like myself who have a messy desk uh, and who are not particularly disorganized, not particularly organized elsewhere in in, in my life, such as um, you know a to do list. I don't plan very well. In fact, I may have mentioned on the program before I used to teach a course in how to be organized and how to use your time effectively when I was in uh, at the Olin School of Business at Washington University. And it was a brilliant class, um, fabulously popular. It was a session, a lecture. And I stopped teaching it when I realized I couldn't implement any of my advice. Uh, so I'm kidding about it being brilliant. Um, so, but we have this idea that we should be organized. We should be clean and tidy. Where does that come from? Why is that... We- the sort of um, why, why do we think of that as as attractive at all? I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it it seems to be quite deep seated. I mean, it's partly just that um, order is a um, is a thing that you can very quickly perceive. It's a it, you can super or at least superficial order uh, is is a thing that you can superficially perceive. You can see whether someone dresses well. You can see whether someone um, keeps their inbox empty, keeps their desk tidy. Um, you can see this stuff. And, and of course, we often make judgments about people based on superficial things, and, and those judgments are often wrong. Um, so it's partly the way we, we look at other people. But I, I'm sure that's not the whole answer, and I don't know really what the answer is to your question, but, but it's, it's a thing that we, we often seem to feel. Um, so you, you have something in common with Benjamin Franklin. Uh, maybe you have many things in common with Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> Russ. I don't know. Oh, I like but, that fly. So Franklin, of course, one of, one of the most fascinating men in history, charted the Gulf Stream, signature on the Declaration of Independence, president of Pennsylvania, inve- inventor of a clean burning stove and bifocals. And I mean, all these amazing things that the, that the man did. But um, some people know the story about Franklin's virtue journal, 
where he he wanted to improve himself. And so he made a list of virtues and they were not really moral virtues. They were more kind of to do with productivity and and good conduct. But they were things like don't drink too much. um, Don't, um, you know, be humble. Don't talk too much. He had this list of things. He had 13 virtues and he systematically worked through his journal every 13 weeks going back to focus on each virtue a week at a time and recording his efforts to improve. And he, remarkably, he succeeded with every single one, except one. And the one he couldn't nail was order. He said, let all your things have their place. Let each part of your business have its time. In other words, you know, keep a tidy desk, keep a tidy filing cabinet, keep a tidy, a tidy and, and well-organized diary. He couldn't do it. And he felt guilty about this his whole life. He sort of felt, if only I'd managed to make more assiduous use of manila folders, I would have actually achieved something in my life instead of being this this loser. So it's extraordinary. Even Benjamin Franklin felt that if he was able to tidy up, he would have done better. Um, Now, of course, I discuss in the book various bits of research about why actually messy desks are highly functional. There's there's a theoretical reason for this, which actually I've, I've learned more about since I wrote the book. We could discuss if you like. And yeah. there's also a, just a practical observation. Studies of people with messy desks find they seem to do very well. People with very tidy desks, they often keep them tidy by filing stuff away. And the filing is often premature. There is such a thing as premature filing, Russ. <laughs> and so premature filing is, is effectively you, you, rather than letting stuff sit on your desk for a bit, uh, you get a bit more context. You understand whether this thing is going to be important and where it might fit or whether it just needs to go in the trash can and you can throw it away. Whereas if you feel you need to keep your desk tidy immediately, you're filing stuff and actually that stuff should just have been thrown away. And so people who have very tidy desks often have huge archives stuffed full of irrelevant material uh, and they can't actually find anything. So so the, the mess is surprisingly well organised. Well, my daughter once was using sidewalk chalk to embellish our walkway when she was probably four years old or so, five, three, I don't know, very young. And she made a beautiful drawing. And then she abandoned her chalks, which were scattered all over the sidewalk, and went into the house. And I thought, you know, I've got this bad habit of being messy and and sloppy and disorganized, but I'm not going to let my daughter go through life with this handicap. So I brought her out and I said, um, you know, Everything has its place, which is a phrase you use in in the book, which is a standard argument people who in favor of tidiness use. Everything has its place. And um, before I could continue, she said, oh, I know. And and this these are the places where the chalk belongs now. (laughs) And she went back in the house. Uh, This is its place. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if it's genetic. Um, Yeah. Yeah, the other but thought, she kind of she kind of has a has a point there though, doesn't she? Yes, because she did. Actually, there's a it's a it's a pretty good place to have the chalk, which is next to the sidewalk where you want to do the sidewalk drawings. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and know, the I, tricky the tricky thing about the motto "Everything has its place" is, I mean, that's fine if you're talking about um, a pair of shoes or a corkscrew or your keys. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Okay, there is a place for my keys, and I should make sure I always put my keys in that place when I enter the house, and then I won't lose them. That's totally logical, makes perfect sense. But when you've got um, mail arriving every day, documents, email, um, colleagues sharing stuff with you, stuff coming in over social media, where is the place for that stuff? How do you decide what place it goes. And actually, it turns out a big pile of stuff is probably a pretty functional way to deal with that because you're never going to, you, you won't be able to categorize that stuff quickly enough. And it's an illusion to think you can, and, it, and it's counterproductive to try. Well, when I taught this course in, uh, gave this lecture in time management, I used to talk about the messy desk and I'd say, what you should do is take all your papers uh, that are spread out all over the desk and in piles and make make organize it. So put a pile for things you have to do, immediate, urgent things. Make a pile for stuff that you need to get done soon, but not urgently. Another pile for stuff you're going to f- file. And then a, finally a pile to throw away or at least to consider throwing away. And by the time you've made the piles, if you're like me, you're so tired and so worn out by making those decisions that you realize you don't you aren't going to do the filing right now or the execution of the urgent tasks. You'll get to that later. 
And then what you end up doing is taking the different piles and piling them on top of each other crosswise so you keep the, you know, the organization in place. So when you're going to come back to it later. And I found it almost never, ever could I get that those simple piles executed in the strategy that I had planned. And so finally, I just gave up. Well, let's ask ourselves how a computer would do this. So I've been studying computer science since I put the finishing touches to the book. So um, there's a an analogous problem in computing, which is computers, as, as you may know, have memory caches. So you've got, a, you've got a big store of memory, but it's pretty slow. And then you have smaller, faster chunks of memory that the computer can, can access really quickly. Um, and modern, in modern computers, there are quite a few different levels of this. Um, and cache management is a really important problem. If you want a computer to run quickly, the decision of what data gets um, put in the fast caches is really important. Um, so but it's pretty tricky because you, you don't, that involves predicting what data you're going to have to use and you don't know what data you're going to have to use. It turns out that um, a very common solution to this problem that has been proved to be highly effective is called the last recently used rule. So what you do is you, you just put everything you've done recently, all the data you've used recently in the cache. And then when the cache is full and you have to eject stuff, you just eject whatever you've uh, you've used least recently. So everything you've been, you've been touching, everything the computer has been analyzing recently, you keep in the cache and then anything it hasn't looked at recently, you throw it out. That turns out to be very effective. Okay. Now, how do we implement this strategy on our own desks? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You put uh, everything in a big pile and then whenever you touch anything, put it on the top of the pile. And um, the stuff that you that is becoming obsolete and that you're not looking at slowly drifts to the bottom of the pile. And um, the stuff that you keep accessing keeps being put on the top of the pile. So your pile is now self-organizing um, and you have the stuff you really need on the top. It's convenient. And every now and then you pick up the bottom half of the pile, have a quick flick through it. And most of it you can probably throw away. So, I mean, the point is, that's not necessarily the very best way to organize your desk. But this pile, we think it's random. It's not random. It's, it's actually quite carefully structured by a natural process of picking up papers and, and putting it back again. And we, I think we underrate that natural organization that the pile of papers on the, on the desk has. And we, we assume it's random. We assume it's just mess. It's actually carefully structured. Yeah, who says econ talk is impractical? And those of you out list, listening out there, I, I seriously, I do like that suggestion. And I, of course, we all, many of us do that implicitly without thinking about it in some way or another, uh, thereby violating my, uh, a friend of mine's dictum, which is touch each paper once and only once, which is another one of these rules for a neat desk, which I could never implement. I would pick a piece of paper. Yeah, I'll look at it later. Maybe I'll decide to file it later. Maybe I'll execute it. Maybe I'll throw it away. But it's better safe now just to keep it on the desk. And later on, I pick it up again. So uh, the the chronological filing system, which you're suggesting is uh, is 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 more effective than that. I, I have to say there is something appealing, even for a messy person like me, to a neat desk. And there is an argument, and it's interesting how difficult it is to implement this argument. There is an argument for, as you say, if you haven't touched something in a very, very long time, it's very unlikely you'll need it. You should just throw it away. So I have a surface. Uh, my wife complains that we should buy nothing that has a horizontal surface because all we do is pile stuff on it. She's right, of course, but it it that bothers me that I, that I, that is the reality. So I always say things like, "Well, we'll just." Eventually, we won't pile we won't pile anything on this one, this desk in my bedroom. Say, "We'll just use this for working at." And it never works out that way. It, it accumulates clothing. It accumulates folded, you know, folded clothes, unfolded clothes, books, papers, knickknacks, pens, all kinds of strange stuff end up across the desk, including a bunch of papers. Those papers I have not touched in about a year. The last time I tried to neaten things up, why don't I just throw them away? And I, I can't. It's very difficult to do, even though I do like the idea of a clean desk. And I don't know why. <laughs> It, it is it is tricky, and and sometimes I wonder whether it's whether it's compulsive the the hoarding behaviour, whether it's is actually not about getting organised at all. Um, it, there's something else going on. Oh, what I would say is um, I'm not against throwing out a bunch of stuff. I'm I'm actually a bit of a minimalist myself. Uh, I don't like to keep too many papers, and I don't like to keep too many clothes, and, and just I you know I'm I'm not a big fan of huge hordes of stuff. But the the point is. Um, 
that a lot of people, when they're faced with with hordes of stuff, their impulse is to try to get it organized. Yeah. Um, and and I think the organization efforts often fail. And you're better if the stuff is overwhelming. You should probably get rid of the stuff. Um, there's this famous book by Marie Kondo, the um, Japanese decluttering expert, which I'm actually a big fan of. People have already. Uh, started talking about messy as as the opposite to Marie Kondo's book, The Life Changing Magic of Tidying Up. But actually, if you if you read that book, um, I mean, we're getting a long way away from econ talk here, but it's all interesting all right. stuff. If you read if you read Marie Kondo's book, one of the things she says is that um, uh, systems for tidying stuff up are a trap. Systems for getting organized, you buy a new filing cabinet. Yeah, um, it doesn't actually doesn't yeah. actually help you. You just at some stage you just have to throw the stuff away. And I I sympathize with that. I have to say. Yeah, those those um, systems and and file cabinets and storage bins they're all I think designed to um, employ people who like to create those. Uh, but they don't seem for me to be very helpful. At least not not so helpful uh, in my personal life. Um, the last thing I want to say about tidying up, then we'll move on to meatier topics, and, and is that when people talk about the productivity of a clean desk and how you're more productive when they make the case, I don't think it's true, but people make the claim that you, you know your head's clearer like the desk, et cetera, et cetera. They don't take into account the time you spend cleaning it up, which is time you can't spend working. So for me, my constant justification, which is probably a crutch, but my constant justification for messiness on my desk and in my personal life where I'm late, you know, taking care of this task or another, it's just that, well, I'm more productive right now. I should be doing the productive things and not doing this act of organization. It's nothing productive about it. I think, I think people also, I, I think you're absolutely right. People also get cause and effect mixed up. So my desk gets really messy when I'm really busy. Uh, and so I feel a bit stressed and I feel there's lots of stuff buzzing around in my head and it, it's natural to blame the desk, but it's not the desk's fault. <laughs> the, 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 the desk got messy because I got busy. Uh, it's not that I started feeling busy because my desk was messy, um, but we naturally, I think, flip that causation in our heads. So the first part of the book uh, is strangely enough, not about desks. Uh, it's about uh, creativity of various kinds and you start off with a Keith Jarrett story, which is pretty remarkable. Tell that story and what we can learn from it. So this story begins in uh, early 1975. Keith Jarrett, great jazz musician, and he was invited to play a concert in Cologne. And the organiser of this concert was actually a 17-year-old girl. She was the youngest concert promoter in Germany. And she had managed to persuade the Cologne Opera House to, to host this late-night jazz concert with Jarrett. Um, but we you know she, maybe she wasn't quite as competent as, you know, she was very ambitious, but there was a, there was a problem anyway, whoever's fault it was, there was a problem with a piano. So Jarrett used to do these amazing concerts where he would just step out and improvise, sit down at the piano, solo jazz, no rehearsal, nothing. Um, but when, the, um, this girl, she was called Vera Branders, when she introduced Jarrett to the piano, it became apparent that there was a big problem with the piano. It was a rehearsal model that had just come out of storage. It was out of tune. A lot of the keys were sticking. The treble notes were all, um, the felt was worn away, so they sounded very tinny. The piano was too small. I mean, there were so many different things wrong with it. And some of them could be fixed. You get a piano tuner and you can fix them, but a lot of them couldn't be fixed. And, um, and there wasn't much time. Jarrett, yeah, there wasn't much time. They just had a few hours. Um, it was raining outside as it happened, so you couldn't bring another piano in. Um, and and the Cologne Concert Hall staff, they'd all gone on, on a, it was Friday afternoon, they'd all gone home, um, and it, this is a late night concert. So they, they just couldn't solve this problem. And Jarrett, I think very naturally, said, I'm not going to play. And, of course, Vera Brandes then begged him to, to please play, and then he felt guilty because she's 17 years old and there's 1,500 people coming, and yeah, OK, I'll play. So he agrees to play. And he, he and his producer decide they're going to record this thing um, because they want a, a documentary record of what a musical catastrophe sounds like. And they record the concert and he plays. And it's magical. It's absolutely magical. And it, it is beautiful. I, this concert was actually, the, this music was actually played at the birth of two of my children. Um, my wife loves it. I love it. Lots of people love it. It's the most successful solo piano album in history, the most successful solo jazz album in history. Um, and yet it was recorded 
because he thought it would be terrible and he wanted a record of it. Um, and I mean, musicologists can explain quite why it was so beautiful. Basically, he was forced to make various decisions about how he played this piano to adapt to all the faults in the piano. And those decisions led to a new way of playing that um, had very soothing um, middle tone notes. They weren't too high, they weren't too low. So it sounded very ambient, but he really had to bang the piano down because it was a quiet piano. And so there's this drive and energy and peacefulness as well. And it's just beautiful. Um, so a few things to say about that. One is, um, obstacles sometimes help us solve problems. Uh, two is we don't, we we don't expect to see that in advance. So, so Keith Jarrett was, was totally understandable that he refused to play. Um, and, and he's a very, he's a radical musician. He's very innovative. He's a very brave performer, but even he didn't want to play this thing and didn't see didn't see this as an opportunity. He didn't think, oh, this is great. This is really going to bring out my creative side. He said, there's no way I'm going to do this. He had to be guilt tripped into it. Um, So, so we, we tend to resist. Now you might reasonably ask, well, why, why would the bad piano make you better? And does that generalize? And I think there probably is a lot of reason to think it does generalize. Various um, pieces of research from cognitive psychology show that when we're kind of knocked sideways or distracted or given slightly more tricky tasks, unnecessarily tricky tasks, we often produce a more creative response. Or you can see this through the lens of computer algorithms, a computer algorithm that has to try to find an approximate solution to a very complex problem. Um, There are a whole family of these algorithms, but they all have one thing in common, which is that they all tend to use some randomness, especially early on. And the reason they use randomness is because otherwise they get stuck at a local optimum. They go down uh, uh, some blind alley, they find a spot that's that's pretty good, but not that good, and they can't can't get out. And this search program the computer's using can't get out of of this blind alley. But if you throw randomness in, and the computer suddenly makes a, a big move and tries something totally different, then it gets unstuck. So both psychology and computer science suggest that you know, we should we should not be entirely unhappy when something unexpected happens, when we're forced to work with a difficult person or with with a substandard tool. It's not not necessarily a problem. I think there's two things going on, and they're important to distinguish. One is the power of constraints. So, haiku being an obvious example of, or just even the classical sonnet uh, that constrains the poet often leads to wonderful results. And then there's the element of surprise, the unexpected, the the discordant, the thing that you weren't anticipating that's th- thrown into your path. And I, I would think that people respond very differently to that. I think some people rise to the occasion. That would be Keith Jarrett. Other people don't. I, you know, I, I was thinking of the um, economist at a conference who lost his notes. And you gave a wonderful example of how the end of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, the actual phrase I Have a Dream was not in the text of the speech. And some people forced to improvise like that or forced to work on a bad piano will suddenly, through adrenaline and and inspiration, rise to the occasion. Other people, like the economist I'm talking about, he couldn't stop talking about it for the first couple minutes of his talk about how unfortunate it was that someone had stolen his briefcase, how awful his talk was now going to be, and how mad he was that, that it was ruined. He just couldn't give it up. So it would seem to me it's very person specific. I, uh, what do you think of that? I think that's true. Um, it is person specific. Um, the although what, what I would say is it, it the, the, this economist might well have done a really amazing economic research if forced to operate under some constraint uh, or forced to work with somebody who, who saw things in a very different way or you know, they, if, um, so the, I think his problem was probably that he wasn't a very confident presenter in the first place. Uh, if he wasn't a very good presenter in the first place, then, um, giving him even more stuff to worry about didn't really help. Although, I mean, you, you, you never know. I, my own career as a public speaker, I, I've sp- been a public speaker for a long, long time. And I was very nervous at first and I had a breakthrough. I was speaking at a school competition and I had, the rules were everything had to be on a three by five inch piece of paper, a three by five inch right. card. Um, and I had, I had printed out my entire, the entire text of my speech 
double sided on this one card <laughs> in tiny, tiny print because I was so terrified that I couldn't speak from some, some bullet points. And halfway through the speech, I looked down and I realized I couldn't find my place on the card because it was this <laughs> tiny writing. And, I, uh, and then I started to realize that I knew the speech anyway, or at least close enough. And then I just started to give the speech w- without looking at the card and, and I got a lot better. So, uh, you know, even if you're not that good, um, sometimes the shock is, is what you need to realize that you can cope. But, you, but you're right. I mean, I, I, I'm not making the argument that distractions and mess and obstacles and problems are always better and always improving. Uh, I don't think they are at all. Um, what I'm saying is that they, they sometimes are, um, but we're never going to look for them. We're never going to seek them out. We, we, we underrate them. And we're always looking for ways to prepare more and to make things more systematized. Um, and that, that doesn't always help. That doesn't always help. Yeah, I was reminded of, uh, I don't know if it's true, but I, I've, I've read that Jackson Brown has a limited vocal range and that that gives his song. It's a little bit like the Keith Jarrett story. It reminded me of it, that he has a limited vocal range. And that, so he writes songs that he can sing. And that gives his songs a certain homey warmth to them that they wouldn't have if he could reach a lot higher notes or a lot lower notes. The other thought I had is this great moment on the Jimmy Fallon show when Jimmy Fallon uh, uh, has a Dina Menzel on and they sing Let It Go. But they're accompanied by instruments from um, uh, the classroom of, say, kindergarten. So they don't have – it's not a great orchestration. It's kazoos and weird little – strange uh, xylophony things, and it's glorious, even though it's not uh, particularly uh, symphonic. So you talk a lot about uh, teamwork and group work, improvisation, uh, collaboration. Uh, What do we know about that? You know, one of the examples you give are the people who can solve problems in Areas not which are not their specialty because they bring a, f- a fresh look to it. Um, is that common or is that just a fluke? Um, I don't think it's a fluke. I, I think you you are you're right to to raise the question in a in a slightly skeptical way. Um, actually, I, I have to say, Russ, I've been really looking forward to this conversation in general because I've been hoping you're going to clarify what it is that I, that I actually think <laughs> about my own book because there's, there's a lot of stuff in there and I was thinking, this is going to be great. Russ is really going to figure out what, what works and what doesn't about this book, so thank you. So um, the, 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 there's an example I give in the book. Well, I give two different examples. I, I talk about a British rowing team and I talk about the, the great Hungarian mathematician Paul Erdős and this very, very different approach they have to collaboration. And this British rowing team succeeds because they're unbelievably focused. They're all exactly the same as each other, and they don't talk to anybody. They don't take any input from anybody, um, even people you would think they should take input from. They just cut them, completely cut themselves off and totally commit and produce this amazing performance that people didn't think they were capable of. So that's a very homogenous team, an isolated team. Um, Erdish, on the other hand... Uh, holds this amazing record for collaboration. He's the most the most collaborative person in the history of mathematics, probably in the history of academia. He has so many joint papers um, across so many different fields. Um, he's just a complete poster boy for the art of of making connections in unexpected places and drawing inspiration from that. And I think laying out those two these, these are those are extremes of the collaboration story. Um, they they tell us well obviously collaboration means a lot of different things and there's an advantage to be to being very committed to a team and really understanding that team and working together and it's all very well oiled and very well prepared and there's also an advantage to um, gaining inspiration by working with total strangers in totally different fields and it depends what you're doing so I, so the whole chapter is against the that background context um, but I think that. There, there are a number of reasons to 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 believe that w- working with people who have different backgrounds, different perspectives, is generally going to be helpful when we're trying to solve new problems. Um, Scott Page, by the way, the complexity scientist, has a whole book on this where he really approaches this problem from all kinds of different directions and shows when it's true and when it's not true. Um, so, so one one basic perspective here is 
um, if you've got, say, four economists in the room, they're trying to solve a problem, and into the room comes a physicist or a sociologist or an anthropologist or just anybody, they would just have a different way of looking at the problem. Or you've got, you've got four Americans and in comes a Mexican or a French person. Um, they're going to see the problem in a different way, have insights that, that help unstick everybody else. If you just have a, add a fifth economist, a fifth American economist, um, that you, you're not really gaining very much. Even if that economist is really good, they probably don't have much to add that isn't already there in the team. So that's one of the things that's going on. But there's something else that's going on that's, that's much more subtle, which is that when we feel uncomfortable because there are different kinds of people in the room, we raise our game. There's a very famous uh, study by Samuel Somers of uh, jury deliberations, where he simulated jury de- deliberations on, um, with uh, black defendants and all white juries, or juries where there were some white people and some black people on the jury. And, and what he found was that the, ju- the, juries, the mixed juries were much, much more careful in really thinking through the evidence that they had heard and making a fairer decision. They took longer. They, they gave people a fair, a fair hearing. Um, but this wasn't particularly, as you might expect, oh, well, of course, because the black people on the jury uh, sympathize with the black defendant, and so they, they raise various objections, and that's not what's going on. What's going on is the white people on the jury see the black people across the table and think, okay, I, I should be careful here. I need to justify what I say. I can't just resort to lazy stereotyping and just wave everything through. So, so they raise their own game. Uh, and there's, a, there's another bit of research I discuss in the book. Um, so there's, it's not racially charged at all, but it's a similar phenomenon where you had uh, groups of students trying to solve murder mysteries. And the, the groups were either three students who knew each other and another student who didn't know anyone in the group, or four, group, four students in the group who all knew each other. And in this case, what's interesting is nobody in the group had any new information. They all had exactly the same information. It's very carefully controlled. But still, the groups with the three friends and the stranger did a a significantly better, really did a lot better in solving the problem. And a lot of that was just people were less lazy. They felt they had to very clearly explain what they were thinking and why they were thinking it because they had to justify themselves in front of this stranger who was making them feel uncomfortable. And the amazing thing about that research is um, pe- the people who are much more likely to solve the problem, the groups with the stranger, didn't realize they were more likely to solve the problem, didn't think they had solved the problem and didn't enjoy themselves. Hmm. So you have this situation where you add a stranger to the group, unambiguously that improves the problem solving performance of the group and unambiguously the group completely f- fails to appreciate this. They didn't like having the stranger around at all. They, they didn't enjoy the experience, and they also didn't understand that their problem-solving capacity had been improved. They just completely dismissed that possibility. Well, I like the example you gave of the uh, investment clubs made up of friends didn't do that well because somebody had a pet investment and the friends didn't feel comfortable rejecting it because they want to hurt their feelings. And so I think there's, you know, there's definitely some truth to that. And certainly when we're people who of different races or uh, backgrounds who might f- change our demeanor, but I think you know, my view of this is that diversity is really um, is overrated, at least uh, in some of these situations, particularly, you know, the example you gave of a, a Mexican or a French person coming into the room. Uh, it really highlights I'm not sure they'd add anything. And what I but, but I know they would add a problem of communication. And so one of the advantages of non-diversity is I know what language you speak. Not, I don't mean just English. I mean, I can communicate with you better. We might have some experience. So to me, there's a tension between groupthink, which is certainly awful, and diversity is a good way to avoid groupthink. Uh, but there's also somewhat akin to the cleaning up of the constantly messy desk. Uh, there's a certain uh, cost in dealing with people who aren't like you because you have trouble communicating with them. You don't understand the same social cues. You don't have the same shared language. Uh, you know, the physicist and the economist, uh, a lot of physicists, I don't think understand much about economics. And I certainly know I don't understand much about physics, so I'm not as dangerous. Uh, and the other thought I had, and this would be interesting, this is a little well, more direct. Be, 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 before, we, before you re- yeah. express that thought, Russ, I mean, I, I, I agree with what you say. I think that diversity is, is overrated by social scientists. Well, 
I'm not sure I agree, but I think that's possible. But what I would say is diversity is definitely underrated by practical people trying to get on and actually do things. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right that having someone else in the room who doesn't speak the language very well or who you're having to communicate with a physicist and, you know, it means all the shortcuts that as economists you can use, you have to explain them to this physicist and he's, he or she is saying stuff to you and you don't really understand, so, and they have to just translate everything. That, that's all completely true. But I think that people are acutely aware of all these issues in the, when they select themselves into groups. Um, but I think they they overrate them, they're too worried about them, and they underrate the advantages that they're getting. So you, you may be right that diversity is overrated by social scientists, but I don't think it, practically people seek out diverse situations as much as they should. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Well, the, the other part I was going to disagree with that's, that's the, again, some of the claims that the research makes that are in your book is a lot of these are about absolutely extraordinary people. So Paul Erdos is not normal. <laughs> He's way out in the right-hand tail in all kinds of dimensions. So he wrote a different paper each week with a different mathematician. Uh, he would you know, work on problems way outside his so-called areas of expertise and find ways to contribute. And I'm just thinking that's Paul Erdos. You know, if most people tried that level, forget that level, anything close to that level of jumping around, they'd just be a scatterbrain. they just have trouble making doing anything effectively. So I, I just there's this trade off there would be the only point I want to emphasize. No, I, I think I think that's fair. I mean there's a story in the book about uh Erdish um moving around a hotel room full of mathematicians, a, a bit like a cocktail waiter might move around serving drinks instead but he's serving mathematical insights. Yeah. So he'll sit down with somebody and just have a brief conversation and, and suggest a way forward and then he'll move to the next person, the next person, the next person. And then at, at some point he just calls out in Hungarian and you realize he's also been listening to his his uh, uh, his mother talking to a friend of hers in the next room in Hungarian, and he's contributing to that conversation too. I mean, it's it clear. Yes, that is unreal. The the, the man was 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 a complete genius, and and yeah, we can't learn too much from that. But what I, what I would say is that I've tried to tell tell these amazing and dramatic stories because I just think they're fun to read. I think they're people enjoy reading them. I hope they enjoy re reading them. But then I also try to back things up and say, well, in a more everyday uh, setting, what's the implication of this? So after discussing Miles Davis producing Kind of Blue um, and being very receptive to ambient noise and, and just doing one take and improvising a lot, I then talk about the experience of people on help desks, many of whom are forced to work through scripts um, by, because that's the safe option. That's the cheapest and safest way. You just work through a script. But actually, when you have someone on a help desk who is actually able to improvise, um, you get a a amazingly impressed and delighted customers. And so I sort of suggest, and we can all do that because all that involves is the, the ability to speak the language of the customers talking, listen to what the customer's saying, and then a little bit of authority to make some decisions. Um, because after all, you're being hired as a human being, not as a... Uh, as a cheap alternative to a um, voice synthesizing robot. So, uh, you know, I, I, I try to, to say, yes, okay, Keith Jarrett did this amazing thing, Paul Erdish did this amazing thing, but then is there an implication for us? Yeah, I don't, I don't find that help desk example convincing. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, yes, there are help desk people who can improvise beautifully. Uh, the reason I think most businesses have a script is not because it's, it's somewhat risky. I think it's incredibly risky to let people improvise. You've got to have a certain incredibly talented level of person. The beauty of the script is that a lot of people can implement it. The challenge of the improvisation is that very few can implement it well. It's true. Most people can, it's easy to find people who speak English, to find people who can empathize harder, to find people who can empathize effectively in language harder, to find people who can empathize effectively and not cost you a lot of money because the things you promise in return, much harder. So I think it's, again, I think there's a little bit of romance about this idea that you can find some examples of improvisation. And, you know, my favorite example is the hotel clerk who, the hotel bell person who's out on the curb and uh, realizes that the people have driven off without their suitcase because he forgot to load it into the trunk. 
and he jumps in a cab and follows them to the airport. And he gets rewarded by his bosses for incredible customer service. But if that happened every day, they'd fire him because uh, that's not – there's too much cost there. So I don't, I don't think you'd want to argue that we should move away from scripts or I – don't, I don't know. Do you? Well, it's it's that, that I like that example. By the way, it's not in my book, but it is a, it is a is a lovely example. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, the guy's brilliant the first time, and he's an he's an idiot the second time, right? Yeah, the tenth so, time he drives um, you crazy. <laughs> the tenth time you tell him to get it, use his own car at least, and not have to, yeah. have to compensate him for the cab ride. <laughs> or maybe, or maybe just put the suitcase in the trunk. Um, <laughs> no, you you, uh, you you raise a good point. I think it's worth um, asking the question. Um, how much of this is being driven by uh, what companies can measure? It may be, yeah. You know, I've never run a multinational company with a help desk, so maybe I just don't really get it. Um, it, it may be that they've done all the analysis and, and what they've understood is, yeah, they might alienate a few customers. It might be kind of annoying to feel like you're talking to a robot, even though both of you know you're actually talking to a human being. Um, but when you do all the maths, it's you you get rid of all the risky uh, risky outcomes, and it's super cheap, and these people don't cost very much. So maybe that's it. But I do think there, there might be a tendency that just that's just how it looks on the spreadsheets, because you're not really able to measure how pleased certain customers really are, or how annoyed certain customers really are. And I, I suspect there may be some of that going on. Uh, I mean, a slightly different point, but related to, to this, to the idea that large organisations can sometimes fool themselves on about what's going on on the, the front line is the, the recent Wells Fargo case. I mean, this is a classic. H- Hayek, I'm sure, would have had something to say about this. You know, this idea that you know there are there are only certain people who are there on the ground and who can actually see what's going on. They understand the specific circumstances of time and place. In Hayek's phrase, um, Wells Fargo, this case where. Um, you know, some boss decided that Wells Fargo makes money when they open a lot of bank accounts, starts pressuring employees to start opening bank accounts, employees to go, OK, fine, we're going to start opening, we opening bank accounts. Yeah. We can do that. No problem. We just don't tell the customer that's what we've done. So, um, yeah. But I mean, all this raises issues of, you know, sometimes you want tighter control over your employees. That's the wrong kind of improvisation. So it's not straightforward, but hopefully these examples make people think about what they actually value and what they don't and what they're willing to pay for and what they're not. The the application I really liked of this idea of improvisation versus scripting, um, you know, that the I Have a Dream example of Martin Luther King's phenomenal. And I I think the real gold standard on this is uh, Churchill, who after losing his place in a speech early in his career uh, and ending up standing in silence, speaking in parliament and humiliating himself and making people worried he was going to die young and go crazy like his father. Uh, He, from then on, as far as I understand it, scripted every single speech word for word and memorized it and then delivered it as if it were spontaneous. And I don't know if he ever went off script, but that's, that's, that's how I try to speak. I try to write my speeches word for word and then not use them, uh, which is kind of what you, the example you gave with your, with your note card. But the more interesting case for me is the, is the, example you talk about is a personal interaction. So we have certain rules of, of behavior in our personal interactions. So I say, how are you? And I don't mean, so I'm not interested, actually. I'm just telling you that I'm alive and that I'm now talking to you. And you say, fine, how are you? Which means, okay, I understand that you are talking to me and I'm ready for your next bit. And there is a temptation, I think, in human interaction to mimic robots, to mimic the script of the help desk. And to fail to ask the more deeper, powerful, beautiful, inspiring questions of each other because we act as if we had a script. And I found that part uh, very interesting. And I'm not sure how to actualize the uh, better strategy uh, besides prompting people with you know crazy questions. But the standard cocktail party sequence of how are you? Well, it was a nice day today. I was surprised it rained. Uh, What do you do for a living? How many kids do you have? Are you married? You know, all of that. It's a certain dance that we have, and it's pretty, pretty rigid. And maybe there's something to be said for going outside the dance. And yet when we do, people are often so jarred by it that they, you know, they they step back. What what are your thoughts on that? It's it's a difficult thing to do, isn't it? So I I write about um, 
the the ideas of Brian Christian, who's a very interesting uh, science writer, uh, who uh, wanted to compete in. There's a Turing test competition called the Loebner Prize, where um, computers, yeah, so computers uh, compete to try to convince human judges that they are in fact human. Um, but in order to implement the Turing test, if you recall the original Turing test, the idea was you've got a com- computer and a human, and you have to tell which is which. So to, to in in a in a conversational environment, so to compete in this Turing test, you need humans as well, and they give a prize every year to the most human computer, but they also give a prize every year to the most human human, and so Brian Christian decided that he was he wanted to win the award of most human human. And, and that got him started on on investigating how artificial conversation works, the history of artificial conversation, all the ways that computers have managed to do it, um, and to, to reflect on what that meant for human conversation. And that what he discovered is, as, as you pointed out, computers are pretty good at simulating certain kinds of human conversation because certain kinds of human conversation are incredibly predictable and robotic. So there's the ritualized stuff. How are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. There's all that. But there's also stuff like, uh, are you an idiot? Um, the insults. Insults are really easy. If a computer just produces a string of insults, it seems very convincing as a human being um, because insults don't have any memory. They don't refer back to, to anything else. And sweet nothings. I think the, the phrase sweet nothings is, is revealing. If you start saying, uh, oh, I love you. I can't wait to see you. You make me feel so good. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. Um, That also can be scripted very, very easily and can fool people because there's a lot of wishful thinking goes on. It's only when you start getting to conversational gambits like, uh, now, when was the last time you you really felt afraid of something? Or um, what's the most difficult conversation you've ever had with your children? Uh, Or or, or what's your favourite hobby? Or are there any hobbies you have? Uh, that you you gave up and you you wish you still did, uh, or that sort of thing. Just something that a computer would just the moment a computer would immediately crunch and uh, you know crash and burn. That's almost, that's an indication. It's probably not a bad human uh, conversational gambit. So Brian Christian used these these much more um, tricky, almost random questions, um, and he would also the the just the pattern of conversation was much more. He would interrupt himself. He would interrupt other people. He it, the, because real human conversation is like that. Um, and he, and the more um, unpredictable his conversation became, the the more like a human it seemed. The messier it got, the less like a robot he was. Yeah, well, of course, some people love messy conversations, and some of them, as you say, they scare people, uh, alarm them. Um, the best conversationalists I know, my favorite people to talk to are people that can establish enough intimacy in a short period of time to ask those kind of deeper probing questions uh, that we normally don't want to talk to relative strangers about or even friends. So it just it just makes you think it's a very, um, you know, we're having, a, you and I are having a conversation right now and conversation I think is understudied um, as a part of the human experience, at least by economists and doesn't get written about a lot. I think it's, it's a huge part of her life. And I think it, it's useful to think about it a little more uh, systematically or at least more creatively. I I think so. And there's a point that has been made by um, the writer, Sherry Turkle, that modern conversation seems to be now more, more scripted and more controlled because it's, it's intermediated through computers, through text messages and through uh, Snapchat and WhatsApp and so on. Um, and her observation, I don't know how true this is, but it seems plausible. Her observation is that um, a lot of kids who grew up with text message based conversation, um, they, they, they actually have a very tidy way of communicating. Yep. So grammar sticklers will say, oh, well, you know, they're not using proper English in these text messages and they're not spelling right and blah, blah, blah. Uh, that, that's completely the wrong criticism. The criticism is that um, these interactions are overprepared and too safe they don't really reveal what the person is is truly feeling and that the young people she was talking to were afraid of face-to-face conversation one of them actually says you know what's wrong with with real-time conversation face-to-face conversation what's wrong with face-to-face conversation is it happens in real time and you can't control what you're going to say 
But of course, that's what's that's also what is right with yeah. face-to-face conversation. It happens in real time, and you can't control what you're going to say. That's why it's so wonderful. So it was a very interesting point to think about. Yeah, and I think um, I pointed out before, but I think there's an increasing demand for real human interaction in our digital world because it's rare. I also think part of the reason that we become so formulaic is we're busy. Uh, our time's valuable. Our time's scarce. Uh, it feels more valuable than it was a hundred years ago. So a leisurely conversation where I ask you, how are you doing? And you say, well, actually not so well. And then you tell me about the last five things that went wrong in your life. And in detail, that's a harder conversation for us to have today than a hundred years ago, not just because the emotional part, but because I, it's hard for me to devote, for people to devote that much time to a to an interaction. And we, we want a short, quick, I'm on my way. <laughs> you know, that's what we yeah. want. Uh, yeah, well, it's, got it. I'm sorry to hear about your troubles, Russ, but yeah. <laughs> you know, I've, I've got, I've got this email communicator in my pocket and I could be, I could be working through my email right now exactly. if you weren't talking to me about, about life. It's I like, have, yeah. I have some uh, we, we need to get better. Don't we? I have some YouTube videos to watch. Leave me alone. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, shifting gears dramatically here, uh, you, you write the following. Apparently, it's easy to make the mistake of setting the wrong target. Why is it so easy to make this mistake, though? Why not simply set the right target? And I want you to talk about the Basel Accords and what banking has to do with Volkswagens, which um, was a very nice uh, sequence there. Yeah, so there's a, there's a whole chapter on targets and the way that targets tend to misfire. And... Um, there's actually a list that a British economist produced a taxonomy of all the different ways in ta- which targets can can backfire. So they can be too narrow, they can be too short term, they can let one part of a, an organisation uh, prosper at the expense of another part of the organisation. So they encourage backstabbing. They can measure the wrong thing. They can uh, blah blah. There's so many different examples, and and um, I, I talk about them in, in, in the book. But the, the Basel Capital Accords, in particular, I think. Very interesting history there. Um, so the, these were uh, agreements as t- between regulators as to how they were going to regulate banks. And fundamentally, they were about how much capital banks should have, which is important because um, if a bank takes a particular amount of risk and the bank has borrowed the money that it's using, um, then the bank can very easily go bankrupt because the creditors need the money back at a particular time. If the, bank doesn't, if the bank's made some losses, it can't pay them back and it's bankrupt. And that's a problem. If, on the other hand, the bank has raised a lot of money from shareholders instead, it, it doesn't owe shareholders in the same way. It owes them a share of its profits, you know, as and when, and nothing in particular at no particular time. So you can raise the same amount of money from shareholders or by borrowing. And if, if you raised it from shareholders, the bank is safer, all other things equal. Um, well, obviously all other things equals an important point to note, but we'll move on. So, um, so how much, how much money banks are raised from shareholders is important. And this is the shorthand for this is capital. How much capital is, does the bank have? Um, so the Basel Capital Accords were this series of, of agreements, um, as to how much capital regulators should insist that banks, uh, uh, had, and they got more and more complicated, and the reason they got more and more complicated is because uh, regulators started thinking, well, you know, two banks could have the same amount of capital, but one of them could be doing crazy casino stuff and another one could be engaged in very safe activities. So we need to sort of reflect that in our rules for capital. Uh, but of course, the ways in which a bank could take risks, there are a lot of different ways in which a bank could take risks. Um, so the, the rules got more and more and more complex over time. Now, I don't know if you noticed, Russ, but the rules were not entirely a success. Yeah, um, I think uh, I think that's a pretty yeah. well held view. I think a lot of people think that's the case. They did not yeah, do so well. They did not do so well. And the the really interesting story I tell in the book is about Andrew Haldane, who's now the chief economist of the Bank of England, um, and who, who was a senior central banker at the time. Uh, he made the following observation. He said, "I've gone back and I've looked um, at." what the Basel Capital requirements tell us about, you know, how, how correlated uh, banks' compliance with the rules is with whether they went bankrupt or needed, needed a bailout. So you would think that banks that are massively over-complying with the rules, have very high capital ratios, should have been at low risk of going bankrupt and vice versa. 
And there's basically no correlation at all. And then Andy Haldane said, uh, why don't we take a look at a much simpler rule, which is just, did the bank borrow a lot of money? Forget all the risk weighting, forget all the complexity, all the, the bells and whistles. Just ask yourself a really simple question. Did the bank borrow a lot of money? Um, and it turns out that's a very good predictor of whether the bank ran into trouble. Um, now, that's not to say, and therefore that's the rule we should have in future, because there's lots of other stuff to, con to consider. But it just raises the point that a very complex series of rules doesn't necessarily make anything any safer. So that's, that's, the, that's the Basel story. But then I move on to VW. You remember the VW story? It's almost exactly a year old. VW were discovered um, cheating emissions tests. And the way that they cheated these tests was to build a car. All cars have computers in now. And the tests are very predictable. There's a particular pattern of the wheels on the treadmill. The, the, the uh, steering wheel turns at a certain time. There's a preset series of maneuvers, uh, acceleration and deceleration. It's very easy for an onboard computer to spot. So they just programmed their onboard computer to realize oh, I'm in an emissions test and I'll change the way the engine is running. It makes it much less efficient, but also much lower pollution. Um, and then when it's back on the road, it'll switch to a much more efficient mode of um, running, um, but also much higher pollution. And it's not totally intuitive why the more efficient engine emits more pollution. But I mean, we can go into that if you like, but it doesn't really matter for the point of this story. Um, so my, but my point is there's a weird parallel with the latest attempts to keep the banks safe. So one thing the Federal Reserve is doing is applying stress tests to banks and saying, we want to see how you fare in this scenario or this scenario. Let's say um, something crazy, like some major economy leaves the European Union and there's a collapse in the value of the euro, say, or Russia defaults on its debt or whatever. We'll give you some scenarios. Uh, price of houses in America falls by an average of 30%. Um, interest rates rise to 4%, all these different things. Um, how, how are you looking now? Does your, is your bank still in one piece under these stressful scenarios? Well, curious thing. What regulators spotted a couple of years ago is that banks were buying very focused packages of insurance to, that would pay off in exactly the scenarios of the stress tests. They had no commercial reason whatsoever and were, in fact, probably quite expensive pieces of insurance to purchase. But it meant that the bank could, with a really straight face, say, well, you know what? In this stressful scenario, we'd be totally fine. And what's going on under the table is, yeah, because our bet that this scenario would happen would pay off and we'd suddenly get an extra half a billion dollars. Um, so the, there's a huge parallel here. You have a very, very predictable test that in principle is very tough, but in practice doesn't mean anything because you can build systems designed to cheat the test. The only difference seems to be that what the banks are doing apparently is legal and what VW would, was doing apparently is illegal. And I'm not quite sure what the legal distinction is. Yeah, well, the, you know, the term used in economics is regulatory arbitrage, the idea that you can game these kind of systems. And of course, employees can game them in private settings as well. The problem is that people who do that can get fired and it's unfortunately not the case that we tend to fire the regulators who designed those bad systems that got gamed. But um, I want to add one more piece to this, which is the Harry Markowitz story. Markowitz, the Nobel Prize winner, who – tell the story of how he allocated his portfolio. So Markowitz um, was a pioneer in um, capital allocation models and this idea that you could put together a – an efficient portfolio that perfectly trades off risk and return. So you could, for any particular targeted return, you could minimize your risk through appropriate diversification or for any particular level of risk, you could maximize your expected return. Um, and it's all about just getting the right mix of stocks and bonds and different assets with different uh, patterns of return and, and covariances. So this is Markowitz's model. So he builds this model. I think it's his PhD thesis. He'll, he's later going to win the Nobel Prize. Um, and then a few months later, He's given a job at RAND and he has a pension at RAND and he has to allocate his pension. Um, you know, this, he's got this, you know, this savings account that's going to go towards buying his, his, uh, his pension. Uh, and it, so he was asked, well, so did you use your you know, efficient um, portfolio frontier model thing, all the bells and whistles that got won you the Nobel Prize? He said, oh, no, I put half into stocks and half into bonds. So 
he, he just the simplest possible diversification strategy. And that story gets told a lot by uh, behavioral economists uh, who I think rightly point out, well, you've got this very complex model and even the guy who produced the model doesn't actually do it. He just goes 50-50. But the twist in the tale is that um, uh, a few years ago, some, some economists looked at how well the Harry Markowitz's allocation strategy actually works or more generally the allocation strategy where you've got uh, say you've got five buckets of, of possible assets and you just go, okay, one fifth in each of the five, or you've got 10 possible uh, buckets of assets. Okay. One tenth in each, just split it, split it all up equally and don't worry. turns out that strategy works really, really well. And the, the Nobel prize winning efficient solution doesn't work very well because we don't actually have enough data to supply all the information we need about the covariances of all these assets. That's a little so like if you've got enough data, if you've got enough data, it works perfectly. And the question is, well, how much is enough data? About 500 years. Yeah. You can observe the market for 500 years, then implement the efficient strategy. Otherwise, this quite crude strategy works well. Yeah, it's a little like indexing as, a, as an investment strategy. It's you, you know you're giving up something potentially, but in reality, you're not giving up that much. In fact, you might be actually saving. You might actually do better, but you know you're going to save – on the transaction costs of paying the manager in the case of the managed fund. And again, it, again, it reminds me of the, the desk. Uh, people often forget the transactions costs of getting to that so-called better solution. So you know, buying and holding, leaving crude allocation strategies, crude rules of thumb where you leave it alone and don't try to constantly tinker with it. Certainly one of the advantages is you spend less time <laughs> and it's often um, that's for and money sometimes. And sometimes you get a better return, too. But the, the time part's often forgotten. So, you know, I, on the regulation part, I certainly get the point that surprises comes back to our improvisation, improvisation conversation. Surprises are better than predictability in that setting. Hard to under might be hard to design a regulatory strategy that's improvisational given the restraints of constraints of the legal system and the way that would actually work. So that's a good yeah. idea. And it's also the case that regulators, I think, and those who are regulated like complicated, complex strategies. One, opaqueness serves them well because people don't have time to look more carefully and they do because they have a bigger stake in it. Uh, but the third thing is I don't, I don't see how it fits in with the rest of the book, uh, which is these are the the Markowitz rule of thumb is is tidy. It's not messy. The regulation of, ba of Basel was mess is, is excuse me was messy, and it should have been more tidy. How does how do you think of these kind of um, results in the framework of the book? Well, it's a fair question. So the way, but I mean, we I can give you a rhetorical answer. So the rhetorical answer effectively is uh, that the the Basel rules were very highly structured. They were got ever, ever more complex in an attempt to track the fine details of all of these different risks. So you could describe them as a mess in as much as there was a lot of them. Um, and that's one way of looking at it. Or, or you could say that this was an overstructured attempt to, the pro to deal with the problem. And therefore it was tidy minded. It was too tidy. Everything, you know, everything had its own risk weight. And um, actually, that wasn't a suitable way of grappling with what's basically a vague and ambiguous and unknowable situation. If you've got a vague and ambiguous and unknowable situation, um, a very crude approach may be better. So, I mean, you could make the analogy with the, with the messy desk, like um, a big pile of papers on the desk is in some ways a very simple rule. Like I am just going to Every time I touch a piece of paper, I'll put it back on the top of the pile. That's the only rule, one rule. Um, is that messy? Is it tidy? I, I don't know whether it's an interesting question or not, but that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the analogy that, that I would make. Uh, we're almost out of time. A lot of, of your examples, uh, not your stories, which are, which are absolutely fantastic, uh, but the, the research that, that you tied to the stories come from – uh, social psychology and sociology, and there's been a, a bit of a, a turmoil, bit of turmoil in psychology over the issue of re replicability. 
And in fact, as reading the story you tell of the research of Diedrich Staple uh, in the book, and as I'm reading, I'm thinking, this is nonsense. There's no way this is true. And of course, it turned out it was a total fraud. It wasn't just that it wasn't replicable. He had made all the numbers up. Uh, yeah, you saw, you saw the punchline, yeah, right? Yeah, I did see so the punchline. You, yeah, I'm a good the, reader. The, the, the punchline is the guy was a fraud, and, <laughs> yeah. and you were like, oh, hang on, I see this one coming. Yeah, yeah but many of these kind of clever results, we won't go into this particular study. It's, it's a great example of these kind of clever studies that get waved around and put on the front page of the New York Times at, at, at first, at least. But it's not these, it, the issue is not fraud. The issue is, is, in most of the cases, it's just that these results were cherry-picked. They were done over and over again until they found statistical significance, the so-called p-hacking problem that uh, we talked about recently with Susan Athey. Uh, are you worried about this in those fields? Do you... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, think this I, is a I am problem. worried. I, I am worried. I think it is a real problem. In fact, I d just before I, I spoke to you, um, I was uh, revisiting this famous result in social psychology that um, uh, Den people called dentists are likely to be dentists, uh, and this is not true. I'm not going to laugh. Been published I'm, in, I'm not going to laugh. Yeah. I'm not going to cry. Just keep talking. <laughs> so um, it's 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 not true, and we've known it's not true for the last five years, um, but people still think it is true. So mm. the, that, the, the column I'm working on is partly about how come even when these results are disproved, do they still get recycled? So, yeah, I'm concerned about that. And I'm, I'm worried about the situation in social psychology, although, um, you know, hopefully this is, this is the beginning of a, of a big improvement because I think they're suddenly getting very serious about better statistical techniques and about replication and so on. And that's great. So uh, congratulations to them. Um, in terms of the use of these studies in the book, uh, yes, I was concerned when you get a really cute piece of psychology based on a fairly small sample. A lot of them are quite small samples. You always worry, is, does this really stack up? So one of the, the rules of thumb that I use is, um, does this is this kind of an amazingly um, counterintuitive result that defies all logic? Um, but because the because P equals 0.04, I'm reporting it. Um, it's passed the test of statistical significance. So even though it defies credibility, I'm going I'm to tell you about it anyway. Uh, I've tried to avoid those circumstances. What I've tried to do uh, is make an argument, you know, start with a story. Here's a story about how David Bowie produced the Berlin albums. Then let's talk about how we perceive that story through the eyes of the people who were there. So I interviewed Brian Eno. What did Brian Eno think he was doing when he worked with David Bowie? Then we go, okay, I'm going to talk to... Uh, some social psychologists and look at research from social psychology, but I'll also look at research from computer science. So how, how does IBM design its computer chips? And I'm also going to take several different pieces of work from cognitive psychology um, and maybe even some, some neuroscience as well. Now, do I think that all of this research is going to stack up? No, I'm sure not. But when it's all from different angles pointing in the same direction, then I, I, I'm, I feel uh, reasonably confident that I'm onto something. I mean, the, the, the piece of work you cited that you particularly liked about um, investment clubs and investment clubs made up of friends doing badly because they were too concerned with, um, with keeping each other happy and investment clubs made up of people who didn't really like each other or, or strangers doing very well. Um, I mean, the first question you've got to ask when you see that is, doesn't the efficient markets hypothesis suggest that they should all basically do the same? Um, and so there's, I wonder whether that that result really stacks up. But what I do know is even if that result doesn't stack up, well, I've got another one and another one and another one, and they're done by people in different fields using very different techniques, and they're pointing in the same sort of direction. So that that's that's well, my defense. I but I think you're right to you are right, right to raise the question. It is the situation is is concerning in social psychology. Yeah, I'm not sure the efficient markets hypothesis would suggest they would do the same, but at least I understand the mechanism by which somebody who proposes a, a really bad uh, idea that I might have trouble going against them because they're a buddy. So I, one of the problems I have with some of the results is that, you know, if my name's Dennis, maybe I'll make, wouldn't it be equally likely that I wouldn't want to be a dentist? Dennis the dentist? I mean, that doesn't even, doesn't pass the sniff test to start with for me. So I, that's one way I try to fight against my... Uh, my compulsion, as we all have as humans, to confirm our biases. and um, But certainly there are issues coming along the line, I think, in these 
in these experimental results that are going to, I think, well, they're already, they're already changing the field. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens. By the way, have you ever in, have you ever interviewed Yuri Simonson? No. He would be he would be a great guest because he's um, he's a psychologist uh, who has been his his work on behavioral economics is very interesting in and of itself. He does lots of stuff on marketing and pricing, um, fascinating. But the last few years, he's just published paper after paper after paper, really quite aggressively taking down bad social psychology. He's written some great stuff and uh, he'd probably be a great guest. So you should look him up. Appreciate the suggestion. And we've had Brian Nozick on a couple of times who's been at the forefront of trying to systematically check the reliability and replicability of some of these findings. Uh, let's, let's uh, before, we, before we close, tell listeners what else you're doing besides writing books and where else they can find your stuff. Sure. Well, well, besides Messy, which is going to be in the shops any minute now, and people should obviously buy hundreds of copies, um, I, I do my Financial Times column. You can find that on the FT website. My own website is timharford.com. That's Harford with no T. Um, and possibly a particular interest to Econ Talk listeners, uh, a couple of radio shows I do that uh, are available as podcasts. One is called More or Less, a BBC More or Less and that's all about the way that statistics are used and misused uh, all around us. So people can subscribe to that. And a new podcast that I think people might be interested in, um, The 50 Things That Shaped the Modern Economy. There's a brand new series. It's coming in um, the end of October. But look out for it. Uh, I'll drop you a note, Russ, when it comes out. Just exploring everything from barbed wire to the barcode uh, to uh, ready meals, to concrete, all these different innovations around us and the way they made, it, made us richer, but they also sometimes changed the game and, and changed who got what and, and why. So I've been having a lot of fun working on that and um, that'll be out soon. And, and both the podcasts, the BBC shows, and they're both free. My guest today has been Tim Harford. His book is Messy. Tim, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>